I, I'm Nick. I've been in Vietnam for about 17 years, so yeah, quite sometimes. Uh, even I sometimes have like a hard time realizing it. Um, been, in, been in tech for a long time as well, like almost all of my career. Um, and more recently, I've been you know, into the Starknet, Stark build, as you say. Uh, and so we've been working on something that I think will interest the builders in the room. Um, I've been in the startup space, startup space for, for also quite some time, about 10, 12 years. And one thing we don't really talk about in, in Web3 in Web3 is, 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 is building startups, right? We talk a lot about protocols. We talk a lot about uh, DeFi, about you know, Cairo, tech, blockchain, finality, all those things but not too much about actually building a, a business on this, and even less so something that is like not DeFi or not NFT something. Uh, so like, you know, so, you know, Uber, I remember back when Uber was like a, a big thing, you know, like startup, everybody was like building a startup, startup, startup. We don't really have this sort of like vibe uh, in, 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 in the, in the Web3 world. And, and so we're, we're building something, and I'll, and I'll describe a little bit uh, what it is later, but basically, we're building something that helps you build a Web3 startups, but with a Web2 sort of like stack and experience. Uh, so you can borrow a lot of what we use to you know, know within the Web3 world. And I'll, 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 I'll go through it. Um, so how does that work? Yeah, so real quick, the agenda. Um, yeah, I mean, the outcome is, is for you to understand how ZKGraph can help you do those things. Um, and, and, and bottom line is, how do you build a Web2 startups today? And how can, like, what is the pain part of building a Web3 startup? Uh, and how can, you know, we help make this easier? Um, so, to, like, obviously, if you, if you want to build a Web2 startups, you need a, you need a product, right? You, you, most of the time, you build, you build something for people, users, um, so you need to you know, talk to users, um, build assumptions, um, users want to, you know, <laughs> fun, fun story, I, I was thinking about those Seoms, you know, I, 17 years ago, you, you had to like, you know, hail a Seom here in Vietnam, uh, and, and, and they were everywhere and asking you, do you want a taxi, right? In, in Vietnamese, and most of the time you would say, no, I don't want a taxi, but sometimes you would say yes, but most of the time you would say no. Now all of this is gone with, you know, Grab and Gojek and whatever. Uh, so that's kind of the assumption, is people don't really want to do this, they just want to be on their phone and in the comfort of their home. And so that's the assumption, the hypothesis is, you know, people will pro get in the value within this new hailing service that they will be willing to give value back, and therefore value extraction. Um, you validate this, typically you have multiple hypotheses, slightly different or sometimes very different, it depends. And you wanna prove them, right? So you want to go out and try that service to get a sense of what you know, you're going to build is actually available or not, uh, and people are actually going to pay for it, uh, potentially. And then you build in value extraction, which is effectively monetization, right? And that's where most people actually die is how do you extract value? And that's actually also true in, in Web3, but, um, but anyways. And so th this typically happens later in the process, but of course you need to think about this because you know, everybody needs to, to eat. And so once you have this product you know you want to build, then you have to go and build it, right? So you design your UX, um, you build your front end, right? That's where the tech part happens. You, you build your back end, Ideally, you deliver small features one at a time, but um, you have your data storage, your you know, security authing and all those things, and then you build all the monitoring uh, that goes with it um, and, and the security dashboard as well. Uh, but those typically happen a lot later. Right, so that's, that's roughly um, how you build a product. And now you have a product that's out there and you need to grow the user base. You need to convince people that's the right product for them you need to find those who may want your product, you need, you need to attract them and you need to retain them and you need to convince them to pay for it, right? So all of those are, are very difficult steps. Most startups fail uh, to, to do those things. Um, so once your product is out, you need to market it, find people who will use it. Um, 
usually you do this by spending money, right? Uh, so you make an, a Facebook campaign or whatever campaign, uh, you put advertising as many as, as much as you can, you, you, you pay for the service on behalf of your users, right? So Uber and all those companies you to use and, and still do finance for your trips. So they were basically giving us free money, right? They were, they were <laughs> giving us free tax rides, for, free or, or, or very cheap for, for a very long time. Uh, Grab, Gojek, delivery, food delivery, in everywhere you look, the reason why all those companies raise so much money is because they're giving it back to users in one, one form or the other. Because attracting users is extremely difficult, keeping them is extremely difficult. Um, and that's, that's a huge, huge uh, area. And, 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 and by the way, just really quickly, on the, the part where you finance services on behalf of users, or it happens in Web3 all the time, right? The free tokens you get for like high yield returns for a new DeFi protocol, that's free money, right? It's money that gets out of, of the, 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 the reserve, uh, the treasury, and that is given to users. Airdrops is free money. It's actually very expensive for a protocol, right? It's not, it's not like they're giving you a free thousand bucks, somebody has to pay for it and it will you know, impact the, the, the mechanical design of, of, of the, the tokenomics. And it's very risky, right? So airdrops are, are actually pretty dangerous in themselves. And, and, and so are um, high yield, whatever it is. Uh, all of those are money issuance, which will deal you the value of, of your token down the road. Um, so what about Web3? This was Web2 picture, um, not too different, but still quite different from a business perspective. That is roughly how you build a Web2 sort of like product. <laughs> you have, you know, the browser, and, and that assumes web product. Um, but it's, it's slightly, it's almost the same for a mobile or, or even a you know, desktop. You have your front end, you have your back end, you have your database. Of course, you have a lot of like side services, but that's roughly it. Um, you replace the back end by, say, DVM or whatever it is. And, and I, by the way, I stole those, those drawings from, uh, I should have put the name, by the way, but I, sorry, I forgot about that. Um, you replace the back end by, by Ethereum, but it's actually not that simple, right? It's actually more something like, like that. And so you have a lot of different complexities around now. So you need to manage, uh, you know, the, the provider uh, that, that talks to your blockchain. If you have uh, roll-ups and if you serve things through IPFS and you, you worry about the wallet and uh, you need to write your contract and this um, make, does away with all the complexity of actually building smart contracts, testing them, deploying them, upgrading them, finding there is a security hack, migrating them, da da da. So it's, it's pretty, pretty complex, right? It's, and the learning curve is also pretty high. And so as a summary, um, if you want to build a Web3 startup, then you add all of those, you know, things to it, right? It's, it's, it, it, it's quite complex. You need to learn how blockchains work, uh, which, which is it, it, it's just a lot of, of things. So when you're, like, I remember the first time I wanted to, like, write a smart contract, you start and you're like, where do I even start? Like, how do I, how do I run my code, right? Because in JavaScript, again, I'm more of a JavaScript person. Uh, it, it's really easy, right? You, you, just, you just create a JavaScript file, node, run, and it's, it's running, but uh, it doesn't work like that. Um, on the blockchain, you need to learn how, how smart contracts, you know, the languages, Cairo, which is still pretty hard, though it's getting a lot better uh, with, with, with Sierra. Design, build the smart contracts, and then you need to figure out the unit tests because you want to make sure that your functions do what you think they're doing, which is Sometimes the case, not always. You need to build integration tests, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You need to audit. You, have, you need to have security audits, if it, especially if you're working with financial instruments, uh, but, but not only. Um, yeah, and the deployment and the monitoring and all, and all those things. Um, from a typical startup perspective, business perspective, um, the, f the typical failure points are actually many, right? Most startups don't survive. And, and this is more like Web2 startups. Web3 is probably slightly different just because you can issue new money, which still doesn't mean that you survive, but you have a little more flexibility. 
uh, versus a, a Web2 business. Uh, and sorry, there's a, lot of, there's a lot happening here, but yeah, no users, low users, right? How many businesses have tried to attract users and ultimately had not enough to even make enough money to attract the next fundraising? Uh, it's, it's, it's very challenging. Um, building your back office, I don't know who have worked in a startup within you guys, but typically in a startup, you, 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 you want to go fast. So the first version you build is a sort of a hack and you build something that just works and you don't really care about the technical depth and the documentation depth and all of those things. You put it out, you have success, you know, you, you, you find some success, then you need to rewrite everything just because the first one was just so hackish that you need to rewrite this. And I've seen this in almost every startup I've, I've, I've worked at. Um, it's very, very costly, very, very complicated as well. Security, not enough funds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Internal conflicts is more the social layer, but also, uh, and that's <laughs> that we're, we want. Um, and so, all of this to bring you here, <laughs> which is a bit of a rough segue. I could have probably gone in slightly smoother, but. We've, in order to address some of those things, and which one I will show you afterwards, but we've built, we're, we're building ZK Graph. And ZK Graph is basically a knowledge graph on uh, StartNet. And, and it's a knowledge graph in the sense that, picture it as a shared graph database across every business, right? So imagine you have your Facebook data, you have your LinkedIn data, you have your TikTok data, blah, 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 you have your Pinterest data. All of those things are in separate databases, none of which can interact. None of you, those users can interact. As a user, you have to create one more account for every new startup that wants to convince you to use them. Um, imagine a world where it's the opposite, right? It's like you have one profile, which is yours, your data, and you can just go from client to client and, and keep your data and look at it through you know, the eyes of this new service that is showing you your data. So say you're tired with Facebook and you want to go to Twitter. Well, all of your data is there because it's a shared database. It's just the client that, that changes. So if there is a new business that wants to monetize you by showing you a bajillion ads and the other next service doesn't, then you will switch to the next one. And that's a win-win-win in, in a sense uh, because as a user you win, and generally speaking, the quality of, of, of what we're being served is better. In, in Facebook, if you don't like the ads, you can either quit Facebook or just you know, deal with it. Right? So it gives you the, the bargaining power, but it's also a, a superpower for builders. And we'll, we'll look at those things. So basically, ZK Graph, yeah, that's kind of like the architecture. Um, yeah, there's a lot happening here. But. Why is it, is it powerful? Um, so think about working with you're building a new app and say it's an, it's an event app and you want to create events. You have, so you have users, the users are here, don't need to create users. You want to create events and you want to link them to a location and add a sponsor to it. And that's it, right? Let's say that this is the start, startup idea. Once you've modeled your data, which is here, the people already exist, but you have the events and the location, for example, then the only thing you need to do from a client perspective is roughly this snippet, right? So you create your event, you link it to this person who is an organizer, so Lady Gaga just organizes this event. You link it to this other dude who's a sponsor for that event and has taken the gold package. Those are purely examples, right? And when it's done, which means the transaction has been finalized on the blockchain, you just refresh your UI. And so that's, it feels like you're working with an ORM or a, anything you're used to today as a Web2 builder, but actually in the background, it's going to call you know, your um, provider, it's going to call the smart contracts that have been already deployed on the blockchain, it's going to create a new um, instance of an event with the params you've passed here, create a relationship between them, and basically filling your database, but you actually don't know, right? So user is, the user, is going to see, do you want to confirm this transaction? Yes, but as a builder, you don't even know it's here. You just know they've done it because it's, it's been finalized here, right? And so that's kind of a superpower because you have the abstraction. You don't even need to bother with like creating a smart contract, reading, you know, like testing it, all of those things we've seen before. 
it's all done here, right? So, and, and yeah, so that's kind of a superpower. Uh, it, it, just, just to be also clear, if you want to add more capabilities, you also can. But uh, as a sort of like high level, your data model is completely handled here and the APIs we'll, we'll see afterwards. And basically in the blockchain, it just looks like that, right? So everything is stored on chain. Yeah, this is kind of a yeah, bit much, but just to, to show that this is an actual transaction on, on ZK Graph, so. Um, the second superpower, we, we've started talking about it a little bit, right? Imagine there are four apps. Well, the first one that brings, you know, some, some users, the second one bring other users, the third one other users. Well, every time a new app brings more users, it's shared across, so everybody wins, right? So if you, if you have, um, yeah, anyways, so every, everybody wins. So everybody has an incentive to bring more users because your users are possibly going to become the next person users and, and reverse. So you, you, it's a win-win-win in sort of an equilibrium where everybody has an incentive to just bring more users and help others to bring more users um, because everybody wins. So it's, yeah, you have a user base that, that is ever growing and of course the network effect on this because the more users, the more apps, the more apps, the more data, the more data, the more utility, more utility, more apps, more apps, more users. So it keeps on, on growing. You can also compose on them, right? So let's say in the event um, management that we discussed earlier, so that's roughly how you model uh, your data. Uh, and that's just simply an example. It can be way more complex or even simpler than that. Say there is an app, there's somebody builds a, a Google Maps or Maps, whatever, and stores all the locations that are in Saigon, right? Well, suddenly in, in your Meet app, you can use all of those locations and still create data on top of it. So you link, you, you, you increase the knowledge graph and everybody who adds a little bit to the graph adds for everyone. So it's, it's compounding value. Uh, and of course, m infinite composability within the protocol itself. And, 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 and this is an example of an app, for, uh, hypothetically within the ZK Graph ecosystem, but because this is on chain, other non ZK Graph apps can also use that data if they, if they want to, uh, because everything's on chain. So yeah, definitely a superpower in my, in my opinion. Um, security, right? Doing an audit on your contract is pretty hard um, and expensive as well. So here, because we're building on uh, primitives and extending those primitives and abstracting them for you, there is a lot of the code that you don't actually need to um, like re-audit, right? All of the testing, all of the unit tests, integration tests, and, and, and those I'll have all be, all be not. So you, you will have some stuff that you can add to it, some smart contract logic and stuff, but it greatly reduces the amount of uh, work you have to do to you know, get out the door. Um, and and, and um, Guilty Gyoza was talking about uh, sharing primitives. Um, that's, yeah, probably uh, something we can definitely gain there. Because the, those core primitives are will be shared across every every contract. So, is of operation, right? And so this is slightly uh, voluntarily kind of minimalistic, because of course it doesn't mean that you will just rely on this guy, because you will have a lot of other services, and you may also have off-chain data. You may also have a lot of things. But if you've ever set up like. A, a, a cloud system for a startup, it is a lot of work, right? Like from just purely, just, just thinking about like authentication, um, you know, uh, data, uh, networking, you know, all of those Kubernetes, I mean, there's just so much work, right? It's, it's fun, but it's also a lot of distracting and very expensive work. And then you need to maintain it. Every time there's a new upgrade, da, 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 you need to maintain this all the time. So it's much, much easier to just abstract all of this data storage uh, to, 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 to the, the blockchain. Uh, and it's not entirely the blockchain. Um, back to this thing here. So there are GraphQL APIs right here, which are off-chain. Um, but all of this is, is handled uh, already. So we centralize a lot of the uh, operational burden. Centralize is the wrong choice of word here, but color. What was the right word? Um, when you like put it in, what I'm looking for a word. 
when everybody can use something that is like shared across. Yeah, I'm looking for it. I'm losing whatever. Um, I'll find it. The other thing is that it's a great experiment platform, right? So if if you have a, uh, say a million users, <laughs> and I hope I hope uh, we'll 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 get uh, way beyond that point, but we're not there yet. Um, let's say there's a million users, and you have an idea, and you want to test it, right? And you want to, you want to test two hypotheses um, that people within this sort of crowd, say tech people in Saigon, right? So it, given that you had events. And maybe you have an app that, that shows people's skill in a sort of, sort of a LinkedIn of sorts. You identify tech people within Saigon, and you want to test two assumptions, right? So within your client itself, you can have two sets of features and show randomly half of that, I mean, however you want to set up your A-B testing. But existing users, different features for different people within the same group, or maybe different groups. I mean, however you want to set it up. But basically, you, you have a lot of freedom to experiment things. That also means you have a lot of room for improvement and for failure, and you can iterate much faster um, than you would in a Web2 startup, right? You can, of course, still do uh, A-B testing experiments in a Web2 startup, but generally, you don't know anything about them before you do the test. Not always true, but, but it's, it's actually very, very hard. So you're, you're starting with a set of assumptions uh, in Web2 that are that are quite hard, um, and most of the time, um, yeah, you have, you have less information. Here you have a lot more information, because assuming you have a million users, you have a lot of data on, on, on them, and they know you have this data, and, you know, and they're willingly um, you know, use it. And, yeah. and I'm not, yeah. One thing I want to clarify here with regards to the data, um, not everything is public, so there is some concept of, of privacy here, but anyways, we won't touch about this here. Uh, but not everything is public. Um, but the public data, people are aware that it's public. Um, so yeah, so you're, you're free to use it without you know, worrying of you know, crossing the line of like um, privacy, things like that. Yeah, and so, so that's, the, and there's more, and there are also caveats, I won't touch about them. You feel free to you know, reach out to me if you want to, to know more, and um, yeah. To call two builders, basically it's an ecosystem, right? It's a, it's a graph, shared knowledge graph, and it will grow in value for every new builder on top of it, and never one will get value from it. So every builder will get more users for every other builder. The user will get more utility for every new project that comes in. Um, and yeah, so a call for builders, if anybody is interested in experimenting, practicing, building a Web2 start well, sorry, Web3 startup with a Web2 vibe. Um, it, yeah, that, uh, that's, that's a very um, valuable platform for you. One thing I, I forgot to kind of talk about is that this, this, it, it, it can pretty much model everything. So if you, I, I haven't really thought about this, but I, I think you could build a DeFi startup on top of ZK Graph. It's typically, Thought for anything that contains knowledge in there, so it's more like adding knowledge, you know, like knowledge about where you've been, or um, you know, your friends, the experience you have, and things like this. But um, yeah, so you could model anything. Yeah, one of the things we really want to see at ZK Graph is non-DeFi uh, apps. Like, yeah, too much, a lot of DeFi stuff happening, and not enough non-DeFi stuff happening. Yeah, so um, I think that's it. And then, yeah, you can reach, you know, learn a little more here and reach me out here um, or on Telegram. Yeah, that's, I think that's it. Yeah, last one. Any, any questions? <laughs> any question? I don't know if we have time for questions or I'd love to know if, I don't know, who thought this was, this was interesting? Out of curiosity, I think. Yeah? And, and you don't have to be polite, just like out of curiosity. I think, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Nick from uh, ZK Graph. I've been in Vietnam for a long time, um, in the tech uh, space for, for quite a long time. Um, been in the blockchain space for about a year and a half, uh, though I've been following for, for since 2017. Um, 
it's been uh, it's been really interesting. The uh, I was at the Biddle Asia for the last two days, uh, and now the the Stockton conference, and it's been pretty cool to see some very very uh, influence uh, influential people, uh, some very some great talks, and a uh, actually pretty big crowd, bigger than what I would have thought. Uh, so it's nice, lots of uh, tech people. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's been very nice.